game that we're going to play that um, goes along with our talk for this morning. So I'm going to give you an item, okay? This item, you don't know what it is, and neither does the audience. So this is how we're going to play this game. I'm going to ask you to turn around, so face the wall, so one, two, three, okay? Okay. And uh, I'm going to, let's see, let's move this so that you have more room. So come over here, Emily. This way, this way, this way. Josh, are you? All right. I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes, okay? Close your eyes. So I, I did buy some blindfolds, but they didn't work. So I trust you guys are not going to see this. And what I'm going to give you, I want you to describe it three times. The audience doesn't know. Neither do you. After you describe it three times, I want you to identify the object by lifting it up over your head and showing the audience, okay? So audience, you'll know what it is. They won't know what it is just yet. So I want to give you an example of something, okay? So I have with me this little remote control. If this was my item, I would tell things like it's smooth, it has buttons, and it has like a hole in the middle, okay? After my third description, then I can reveal to the audience what I think it is. And I think it's a remote control because I already saw it. Does that make sense? Do you understand that, guys? Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's, let's get this game started. Now, you guys don't know what it is. Neither do they. So they're going to describe the item, but you have to wait till your third description to reveal to the audience and to us what your item is. So your eyes are closed. Okay, let me, uh, can you hold this real quick? All right. Give you an item. You're going to describe it three times. If you can't, open your eyes. Ready? I, I see it, but the blindfold didn't work. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not a live animal. Nothing gross. All right, they have their eyes closed, okay? Don't lift it up, put it down. All right, you can only describe it three times. Ready? So I'm going to give you one answer each. We're going to start over here with Emily. Describe your item once. What it feels like. <laughs> your, oh my, okay. Wait, wait. Is this a dinosaur? No, you can't, you can't identify what it is. Describe to us what it is. It's pokey. Okay, it's pokey. Josh? Oh, it's smooth. Smooth. Okay, Elijah? It's rubbery. It's rubbery. Okay, second description. Emily? It's got like a pedestal. It has like a pedestal, okay. All right, Josh? It has legs. It has legs. It has a head. It has a head. Okay, third and final description before. Okay. I think it has ears. Think it has ears. It has a head. It has a head. It has a tail. It has a tail. All right. Now, this is where they're going to have to guess what their item is. Hopefully, they didn't open their eyes. Okay, so lift up your item. Audience, you have to remain quiet, okay? You can't say what it is, okay? No, no, no. Lift it up over your head, over your head, over your head. And we are going to ask Emily. Emily, what is your item? I think it's a pony. I think it's a pony. <laughs> okay. Josh, what is your item? I'm pretty sure it's ham from Toy Story. Okay. All right. Elijah? Oh, I think it's a dinosaur. Okay, it's a dinosaur. All right, open your eyes. Oh. <laughs> now, we're going to trust. Go ahead and leave those there. Thank you, guys. Let's give them a round of applause. We've got to trust that they didn't see what they were doing. Hopefully, they, hopefully they, they did not. But you guys got the idea. Now, we're going to leave that here so you can see this, our audience there. Okay. So, what does this game have to do with anything? Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask those who are volunteering, okay? While your eyes were closed, I hope your eyes were closed. While your eyes were closed, could you identify what your item was? Yes? Where's my third? Where'd she go? Okay. 
Elijah. Can you identify? He's not here. All right, so Josh, could you tell what color the item was with your eyes closed? No, why? Because you couldn't see. Because somehow the item, okay, what's outside was outside of your reality. It was outside of your reality because ultimately for you to be able to identify and align your expectation, you have to be able to see. Now let me ask you this. Maybe you're going through a situation right now that you can't see the end. You can't really see how it's going to wrap up. All you can do is feel your way through like someone in the dark. Could it be that in order to be able to have everything come together, you, be, you have to have the ability to see? And today what I want to talk to you about is the God who sees. And the name that I want to teach you is El Rai, the God who sees. Because it's only the person who can see is the only person who can identify what is going on. Because maybe some of us are going through a situation right now that all we can do is describe it. All we could do is identify how it makes us feel, but we don't know why we are going through it. We don't know why we have to endure it. But maybe today you have to understand that God knows and he sees how your story will end. Today, we're going to talk about three characters who found themselves in the dark, and all they could do is feel, their, feel uh, the, the experience, but they could not make, and they could not make sense of what was actually taking place. So with this, I invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we invite you right now. We ask that your presence be here, and more importantly, Lord, that your Holy Spirit be in our minds and in our thoughts. Father, we want to connect with you. We want to know what you want us to know, and we want to experience what you've desired for us to have. We thank you, Father. We ask that you bless us now as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want you to open your Bibles or scroll with me to the book of Genesis, and we're going to introduce to you our three characters. So Genesis chapter 16, Genesis chapter 16, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 3. Ready? It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children go and sleep with my servant perhaps i can have children through her and abram like any good husband said si sí, senora all right and abram agreed with sarai's proposal so sarai this is what it says so sarai abram's wife took hagar the egyptian servant and gave her to abram as a wife and this happened 10 years after abram had settled in the land of Canaan. Now, females in the room, would you guys do that? <laughs> would you give your wife or your husband to another woman to take as a wife? Of course not, right? That's just stupid. That's just dumb. No one would ever do that. Well, according to tradition, when women could not have children, they would look to their either their handmaids, their servants, their their, you know, property. And through them, they would say, OK, your child will now be my adopted child like a surrogate. And so here we find this at the very beginning. And we find these three characters, Sarai, which we later know as Sarah, Abram, who we will later know as Abraham. And then we have this third character that we're going to look at just in a few minutes, Hagar. You see, each, each of these characters have a desperate moment. Sarai is desperately wanting a child. She's probably in her mid-80s knowing that, you know, having children is going to be nearly impossible. And for her, this was her desire. This was her dream. She longed to have a child of her own. 
Abram was desperately wanting to see the promise of God because 10 years before, God had taken Abram outside. And he had showed him all the stars. And he said, Abram, you see all those stars? Try to count them. Go for it. Start at one end and start working your way through the other. And Abram was like, no, 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 no. This, this is impossible. I can't. And God tells Abram, just like the stars, that's how many descendants you'll have. Just like the stars, that's how many children you will be blessed with. And of course, Abram's eyes just open like, seriously, really, God? And God is like, yeah, all these will be your descendants. Ten years have passed, and that promise had not been fulfilled. But what did Hagar want? You see, Hagar desperately just wanted to be known. Hagar desperately wanted to just be of relevance. Hagar just wanted someone to love. And what we do find is that these three characters desperately do something that God never intended and God's plan was never for that. But because they got so anxious and they got so desperate, they just, they just did whatever they could because they felt that they needed to do something because nothing was being done. And guys, here is what we want you to know. Because the idea of what we're about to talk about is simply this. Our vision, say it with me, our vision is limited. We can only see what's in front of us. We can only see what's beside or at the end of our nose. I love what my wife tells my kids when they're looking for something. And it's right there, like it's right in front of them. And they're like, I don't know where it's at. I don't see it. I don't see. And my wife says, it, it's almost it's, it's there right in front of your face that it's almost going to hit you, right? In Spanish, it's a lot more smoother. But basically, that means it's right there in front of your nose. Just look at it. And it seems that sometimes we have the same experience that we can't see what's going on and why we're going through something. But this is the part that I really believe. But God's vision is limitless. Well, we can only see what's in front of us. God sees all and he knows all. God sees all. And what we want you to know is that God has the ability. God has the ability to see whatever you're going through and he knows how the story ends. But we, let's be honest, we want to know how the story ends, right? Like, a, like reading a comic book, you see the character going into a very difficult situation. It's almost impossible for him or her to be rescued. And it looks like the villain is going to win. And then we turn to the back page and we know how the story ends. We feel like this is what we need to do. But the God that I want to introduce you to this morning is the God who sees. And the God who is able to take whatever our circumstance, how difficult it might be, and show us that there is a way out. I love this next statement. God takes chaos. God takes chaos and produces creation. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what did God use? There was nothing. There is nothing. The Bible says that the world was void, was empty, was dark. And God can create light. It says God takes darkness and produces light. That's like me taking my white shirt and putting it in a bucket of, of, of red paint and expecting that when I pull it back up, it's going to still be white again. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. How is it possible? But for God, we realize nothing is impossible. And finally, God takes the tragedy of the cross. As excruciating and humiliating and painful as that was. And he produces redemption. You see, for Hagar, all things were against her. Because this is what we don't, we, did, we probably didn't know. Hagar had no name. Now, some scholars believe that Hagar's name comes from the incident because Hagar's name is actually to flee, not like a flea, but to flee. And we find in Genesis chapter 16 that because of Sarai's very smart idea, she gets pregnant. 
And like any person who's pregnant, there's always this level of excitement, right? Like, oh, you know, they rub their tummies like, oh. I don't know, girls, that's kind of creepy if a stranger just comes up to your stomach and starts rubbing it, but that's what people do. And so they're like, oh, what are you having? Oh, I'm having a girl. Oh, I'm having a boy, right? I'm not having one. Girls would be having one, okay? And uh, knock on wood. <laughs> I have two enough. So um, here's the thing. So whenever there's a baby, there's always excitement. But in this case, Hagar's pregnant and everybody's mad. Sarai's mad. She's like, I can't believe she's pregnant. And we would be like, well, duh, like you gave her to your husband. What do you think they did? Okay. They didn't color. We won't go to what they did. But, but she's pregnant. And Abram's mad because his wife is mad. And Hagar, instead of being excited about her baby, now she's depressed. Now she's upset and she's angry and she's thinking, how could God allow such things? But this is what we find in Genesis chapter 16, verse 7. Because what we find in Hagar, we find three things. Hagar has no name. Hagar has no family. And finally, Hagar has no support. But listen to what happens in verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar, found Hagar beside the spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. Scholars believe that this angel of the Lord is Jesus himself. So Jesus found her. And isn't that amazing that Jesus finds you where you are in your circumstance, in your situation? You would think that, uh, you know, this particular story, you know, she's, she's, she's a, clearly not a Hebrew, so she really doesn't have the favor of God. But we find God's unconditional love. We find a God who is desperately wanting a relationship with people, even people who claim to be enemies of God. And we find here that, that Hagar is running because the Bible says that it got, so, it got so difficult where she was living that Sarai started to mistreat her and, 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 and abuse her. So she just ran. And we believe that she was running back home. She was going back to Egypt. And this is where the story takes place. You see, Hagar was running because she had nothing to stay. She had no reasons to, li to live or to even be a part of this family. But we find Jesus finding her. And this is the beauty of this story because this is what you and I need to know. That the God of the universe, the God who created the galaxies and the stars and the planets, the God who has created all the oceans, knows your name. The God that is infinite sees every single tear you've shed. And this, this is powerful because maybe this is something that someone needs to know. Wherever you are, however you feel, this is what I want you to know. You matter to God. She matters to God. So the, there's three things that I want us to take from this story. Ready? The first one is God knows who she is. And here we find that he calls her by name. He tells her Hagar, Sarah's midservant, or Sarai's midservant. How is it that God knows her name? Because God knows what you're going through, and God sees how you feel, and it hurts him. God sees what you are experiencing and he longs to be close to you because let's be honest God found her but doesn't it seem that sometimes we don't want to be found by God we want God to be on the outside looking in we want God to be with us Monday through Friday but Saturday and Sunday they're they're for us right uh, we want God to be with us only when we take a test, but not in the hallways or in the bathroom or in the locker rooms. We want God to be with us when we're driving, but not when we're, when we're friends and we're about to watch a movie or we're about to go do something that we know we shouldn't. How is it that we've compartmentalized uh, God in the sense that we think that God should only be at church or God should only be while we're praying and asking for him for something? God wants to be intimate. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be as close as he can be. And God shows that he knows 
her name. And the angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai servant, where have you come from and where are you going? And she replies, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. It got so bad she couldn't do anything but leave. It got so bad she couldn't do anything but, but flee. And from there we find her name, Hagar, the one who runs. The second thing we find in this story is that God knows. God knows why she is there. I want you to come with me to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16, and you see here in verses 6 through 9. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. And then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and I will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. Next verse. It says, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Thus saith the Lord. There's only three times that the Bible mentions the birth of a child before it will be born. This is the first time. Hagar, a non-Hebrew, receives a promise that she is going to have a son. No one before, there was no, you know, ultrasound where you could see, you know, oh, it's a girl. Oh, it's a boy. I could tell it's a boy, right? Yeah, there was no way you could figure that out. Now, I know we have some, you know, grandmas and grand aunts. They, they could figure, you know, they can tell by the shape of the stomach and all that kind of stuff. But in those days, there was no ultrasound. So you just guessed if you had a boy and you guessed if you had a girl. Here, the angel says, you're going to have a son, a special son, and I'm going to bless your son. You see, no matter how difficult your circumstance, God can see you through. Because let me tell you right now, it is in the darkest of nights when you see the stars shine the brightest. It is in the darkest of nights. It is when you feel you are extremely alone. When you feel that you've cried so much that, that you know, it's just, it's terrible. Your mascara is everywhere, right? Not for guys, but I'm talking for girls. And, and you know, you're crying so much that, you know, you're, you're starting to breathe heavy. Why is it that it's in those moments you think that no one cares, that no one is there with you? God is there. God is telling you, I'm right here. Barbara Johnson says this, faith is seeing light with your heart when all your eyes sees is dark. Let me let that one sit. Faith is seeing light with your heart when all your eyes sees is darkness. See, guys, I want you to know this, that the name of God, the name that we want you to know today is the God who sees. And we believe that that what God is showing through this story is I know how your story ends. You might not think that Anything good can happen out of this. You might think that it's impossible for you to pass. You might think that it's impossible for anything to, to be positive. But God is trying to tell you right now, trust me. <laughs> I have a vantage point. I can see beyond what your nose can see. I can see beyond what you think you are feeling because I'm the God who sees all and knows all. Because the third and final thing. The third and final thing is this. God knows what the outcome will be. God knows what the outcome will be. And here in the story of Hagar, we find a person who perhaps had never even heard about God. Perhaps didn't even know that a God existed. But now through her situation, now through her difficulty, she was, her eyes were open and she was able to see that God, in fact, is with her. And this is what I want you to know, that God knows how your story ends. If you were to ask me 15 years ago, 
that I would be in this place, I would have never dreamed it. I've told you guys before, I'm from California, right? I never thought about leaving California. I never thought about coming to Texas. But God brought me here. I never thought that the years that I struggled to find a job, I ended up being a substitute teacher, teacher, te a substitute teacher, perdón, okay? And because the fact that I started to feel and teach, they eventually gave me a teaching job. But my dream and my desire had always been to be a pastor. And for some odd reason, for four years, God allowed me to be at this school and teach kids about P.E. and teach kids about world history and teach kids about, uh, what were the other things, uh, earth science. I don't know anything about that stuff. But God used that. God took that and molded me in such a way that I now here do the same thing. And God has given me the opportunity to serve you as your pastor, as your friend, and for some of you, your mentor, so that I can lead and you can help me lead a generation of students who need to know that there is a God who sees. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of people who think that God can't see, that God has chosen not to see, and that God has abandoned them. Because here's what we believe. In Habakkuk, this is the last verse I want to share with you. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, it says this. The vision for a future time. This vision is for a future time, and it describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it, for surely it will take place. It will not be delayed. What is a vision? A vision is a picture. A vision is a portrait. Apparently, sometimes we want to know what's going to happen. For those of you who are graduating this year, you want to know what career you're going to go to. You want to know what college you're going to be accepted into. You want to know perhaps of how much money you're going to be making after college. For some of us, this is your freshman year. <laughs> and you're just getting started. You want to know what, you know, what places you're going to be able to go to and, and who you might be able to date. I don't know. Uh, you know, you're, you're wanting to know. You want to know all those things. But remember, your life is a portrait. But don't ever forget, guys. Don't ever forget that God is not done painting. Your life is a process. Trust the God who knows what your picture will look like. And the next thing, it might seem slow. It might seem like it's taking forever. But be patient. Because maybe this is a question that I want you to wrestle with. What is it in your life right now? What is it in your life right now you're not sure of? What are you wrestling with? What is it that in your mind you're thinking, man, I just wish God would just turn on the light. I hate being in the dark. I just wish God would reveal himself like a neon sign. I just wish. El Rai. El Rai. Trust the God who sees. As we end, I want to invite you to trust God, to open yourself and be vulnerable, to allow God to see those things that you try to hide from people you don't want them to see because you're embarrassed. Because maybe, just maybe, you need this reassurance and you need to know that there is a God. And more importantly, that, that not just there is a God, but there's a God who is with you. And what Hagar tells us, she gives God this first name that we've never heard before. El Rai. You are the God who sees me. You are the God that I can trust. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we want to take your name hold it close we want to take your name and believe wholeheartedly 100 without any reserve that god you can be trusted so father please bless us now thank you so much for this sermon series thank you so much for the people who took part in planning this out because lord we believe that there is a name that fits our individual struggles 
Lord, we pray for our offering. We pray for those who will be giving. Lord, we trust you that we will reach our goal. And more than that, we will be able to share God's blessing with people that we probably will never meet. May your kingdom come in our hearts, Father. Thank you so much for all that you do. In Jesus' name, 